This morning's opening words is from a, re a reading by Rainer Maria Rilke, Live the Questions. Be patient towards all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms, like books written in a foreign tongue. Do not now strive to uncover answers they cannot be given you because you have not been able to live them. And what matters is to live everything, live the questions for now. Perhaps then you will gradually, without noticing it, live your way into the answer one distant day in the future. I now invite you to join in. So I heard, well, let's actually open this. Anyone want to open this who hasn't in a while? Holly, would you like to? Thank you. Oh, what is that? A box in a box? Oh my gosh, you can go sit down. This, do you know what this is? It is a crayon box, but it's also the question box and it only appears once a year. And it sounds like there might be some questions in there. Did some of you get a chance to write some questions down? Let, oh no. These are all from you all? Okay. Okay, here we go. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to go through these real quick, okay? Here we go. Um, are you, I assume you mean me, a part of the LGBTQ plus community? And so no, I'm not personally a part of it, um, but I'm a big supporter of it. Do you, do you use Duolingo? Yes. Who put this one in? 277 day streak. Thank you. Spanish. Okay. What do your, oh, okay. What do my feet smell like? Okay. Well, who wrote? I'm going to guess what you meant was walking upon this beautiful earth. They smell like flowers and that's what you meant. Okay. Have I get out of bed? Well, like beautiful flowers. Okay, here we go. What is my fa favorite flower? Well, I really love the rose. How many people do you think live on this earth? Ooh, well, double question. There's a number. And then how many people are like awake? You know what I mean? Like kind of like consciousness there. I think it's probably like eight, eight and a half billion right now. Something like that. A, a few more just were born. Do you like the McRib? Okay, this is another one. I'm, I'm impartial. I'm impartial. What do you eat for breakfast? I really like, um, what do I like for breakfast? I like coffee, of course. Uh, I usually have a lighter breakfast. So coffee, maybe um, like a muffin or something like that. What do you put on your toast? Wait, do you even like toast? Good, good follow up. Um, actually, I like peanut butter on my toast. Um, and I like peanut butter in general. Do you like cereal? If so, what is, there's a lot of food questions. Do you, do you feed your children? Okay. Um, uh, my favorite cereal probably is some type of Chex or maybe, yeah, Chex, I would say. Maybe cinnamon Chex. What do you believe happens after we die? Pivot. Wow. Well, here's, a, here's, a, here's one way you could answer that. What happens after we die? A lot of people didn't die. And a lot of those people are going to hold your memory in their hearts and try to figure out how can I live in a way that honors the life that you lived? What happens to us is kind of a big mystery. Some people believe we just die and others believe we go somewhere else. There's a great, uh, was that Dement, uh, Dement, uh, like the mystery B song. That's a good one to play for your kids at home. But you know, that's the great thing. And that's where our imaginations can kind of come in handy sometimes because there's no one answer that is right. What college did you go to if you went to college? <clears throat> I, was that like an observation? Like if you even, if you even went to college, um, it's a nice smiley face too. Um, I went to DePaul University in Chicago. Um, and then I went to Chicago Theological Seminary uh, which is also, as the name says, in Chicago. And I studied religion and I studied 
peace and conflict resolution studies. What do you, another, what do you think happens after you die? You guys should talk. Um, as a minister, do you get a lot of time with your family? Thoughtful, thank you. Um, I do get a, good, a lot of time with my family in part because this congregation really values me as a whole person. And so when I got here, they saw that I was um, a young, younger person with a family and then Holly came along pretty quick. And so from the beginning, there's been a real generosity of spirit to understand that the goal of me being here is to not burn me out. <clears throat> okay, we'll add that one later, maybe. How do you personally think humans were created? Oh, well, I really love, you mean from the beginning, maybe, but there's like owl, there's an owl training a little bit later. So there's some of that, how children were created, but humans I believe in evolution and all of the great unfolding for billions of years that unfolded is kind of a, quite a beautiful story. Um, too long for today, um, but that's how I believe they were created. Uh, how many how many multiverses do you think exist? Oh, okay. So this is kind of multi, uh, multiverse, uh, like a universe. Um, I would say infinite. I don't think you can have, uh, it'd be weird to just have two. Um, that seems or a random number. Many of these questions will sound will 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 kind of sound insane. I assume you mean like off, a little different. Uh, don't take any of it personal. Oh, I think that was just from uh, Adrian, or I think that was probably just from Sunny or something. <clears throat> Am I going anywhere for Christmas? Um, no, I'm going to be here Christmas Eve. Good plug, 7 p.m. here with all of you. So I'm going to be here, and then. Later, later around New Year's, we're going to go up to Michigan. How many galaxies are in the universe? Well, now you're just like four. No, I don't. There's more than that. There's more than that. How old are you? When is your birthday? I am 34 years old, and my birthday is way next Friday. I think we're almost done. What? When were you born? 34 years ago. 35 years ago. Next Friday um 1988 i know what is your opinion on cap and crunch mm, middling what is your favorite candy reese's peanut butter cup everyone knew that one what is your favorite christmas movie um i really like elf but i'm also really into Chris christmas story uh with the little the little boy what is your duolingo streak 277 what is one word you would use to describe yourself? Enthusiastic. What did you have to do to become a minister? A lot of things. It's very rigorous. And actually every day I do things to continue to become a minister. It's, a, it's just like becoming a fully human. You know, you just gotta keep practicing at it. But one of the big things is you have to have an undergraduate degree. So go to college and then you have to go to seminary to get a master of divinity degree, which is three years. Um, you know, like 24 classes, so like 80 year. And then you have to do a unit of clinical pastoral education, which means I work in a hospital as a chaplain for 400 hours. And then I also have to work in a, um, a, a, a congregational setting for a year as an intern. And that's it. This better be a good ending. Let's see. Oh, how old am I? That's good. How old did you think I was before I said that? I should have done that one. 28. Wow. Oh, okay, just trying to a uh, price is right it. Um, all right, so we are gonna sing our children off to their classes. You're gonna have so much fun today, and you all have some tough, tough uh, shoes to follow. So have a good day. I title this piece and you use under the magnifier. I recently found an undated article online titled, Why You Should Not Be a Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> the Reverend Dr. Tony Larson, who Nick later told me he knew, explains how our open and loving community is not for everyone, especially those who are insensitive and tend to hurt others. His essay ranges over several topics, 
but near the end, he makes a provocative statement that seems to contradict our service plan for today. Quote, you should not be a Unitarian Universalist if you want all the answers, because we don't even know all the questions, unquote. Don't worry. He says this for those seeking religious dogma to rule their lives. He does not mean to prohibit questions asking, question asking altogether. We know you use are intelligent, curious beings who question everything. After all, questions are important elements of critical thinking. We often get questions about who we are and what we believe. As a newer member, you might simply want to know more about the history of Unitarian Universalism before you feel ready to answer questions from non-members. Or you might be feeling anxious about the goings on in the broader world today, how to respond, and what are we risking when we do respond. Today, you have the chance to voice UU-related questions for Reverend Nick to answer. He might have been guessing what you will ask, but you could surprise him. Please know that this is a safe place to ask about touchy subjects. So I hope you find this meaningful, useful, humorous, whatever you wish to get out of this. Okay, have you ever experienced a spiritual place? Where was it? Do spiritual spaces have anything in common? Um, yes, I have. There's several places that have felt deeply spiritual to me. One of them was uh, in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, where my family and I attended a uh, Unitarian Universalist summer family camp uh, for over two decades. and. Uh, they continue to go. I don't have as much free time, um, but that uh, in Lake Geneva on the George Williams campus, uh, college campus, it was uh, a deeply meaningful, intensely formative space for me as a young person. Um, kind of like sleepaway camp can be for some people. Um, this was a place where I deeply felt um, nurtured in community and definitely heard the earliest space uh, call parts of my calling as a minister, um, which became more clear when I was 16. Um, I would say some of the commonalities is that there's enough space or spaciousness that doesn't have to be three dimensional space. It could just be like, uh, or it could be silent space. It could be, um, uh, temper like the temperature is like the right space for you to be in that really allows for um, a deep deep presence um, that can look very different to a lot of people uh, for me I often find it in nature which a lot of folks I believe resonate with um, but I also find it to be when I'm with people I love and care about um, so um, a place like a sanctuary where, where a congregation gathers can be a very spiritual place doesn't mean it doesn't need to mean that there are spirits among us, um, but also that you all are um, filled with that spark of divinity, um, as all life is. Okay. This is a little bit. Lately, I've struggled with being blessed. We don't have an abundance of money or a four thousand square foot house with a pool, but my children have safe places to exist, and there is food in our pantry. This puts us automatically in the top percentages of people in the world. How then can I justify asking for more, a promotion at work, for example, to move to a nicer neighborhood, et cetera? It doesn't feel wrong. It doesn't feel wrong to want more out of my life or want better for my kids. But at the same time, I feel disgusted at how blessed we are and how little we've done to deserve it. So first, your feelings are valid and these are feelings that so many people have, which is an important thing to know that there are people in this room who didn't write this card that have thought this and felt this deeply. Um, there are lots of layers to this, um, not the least of which is our systems of privilege and oppression in the United States and in the world that do create that sense of um, 
like whether you've earned it or deserve it, as you say. Um, and, uh, and so that requires some real deep reflecting on one's life experience, your history, and also how you're living your values today to sort of take those privileges and, and seek to not dismantle them as much as uh, shape them towards um, a collective um, liberation or greater love for those who have um, less privilege than you. Um, I think it's important uh, of, to d differentiate what you've said about, you know, the the move towards kind of this unattainable American dream that just keeps getting bigger and it's very consumeristic or capitalistic. And this does idea of understanding the centrality of your kids and the importance of your kids and 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 the uh, lower Mas Maslow's hierarchy that, hey, it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, that's a critical piece that we shouldn't neglect. Um, I also think that, um, I hope that this can be a place where we talk more about income, in income inequality, um, uh, economic strata within the congregation, that this is a diverse, uh, diverse congregation in regards to wealth. And if we erase that, then it becomes harder and harder to see ourselves as Unitarian Universalists if we don't fit into one particular vision of Unitarian Universalism. How could I, um, how could I see who, how could I see about getting a UU group going in the community where I'm moving to in several years? Who's leaving? No, um, so, so first I'd love to know where you're going because I know a lot of people and uh, you might very well have some options where you're going. Um, if you don't know where you're going, uh, we can we can talk more too. Um, I think that's a really great thing. It's not great just because of the great feeling of wanting to continue engaging in UU community, but that you know that when you go to a new place, you need community. It's really important to not take that for granted. Um, there are resources online of like looking up where UU congregations are and things like that, and I'd be happy to do that. Most of that is on the U UUA.org website. What is the most uh, difficult aspect of being a minister? Um, I would say um, having a, a, a loose, uh, um, an open hand, a loose hand on um, relationships and time and things. Um, people um, come here for short amount of time or they're here uh, for decades. Um, I've been here six years and it's, it's hard when people pass away, um, and losing those people and feeling like I got only six years when some of you've known each other for decades. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing, you know, to, to, to acknowledge the fleeting, uh, passage of time and also that people move away, you know? So, um, it's a recognition. I think that, um, you know, to not take for granted community, to savor every uh, moment we have together, and to um, and to tell each other how we feel, and 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 what we mean to one another. What what's your advice to someone who has a dream uh, for their life that feels big and scary? Well, first of all, I love dreams that are big and scary. They're not nightmares, but they are something that I think is is really where you're heading in the right direction. Sometimes I think we really close our imagination off to what's possible in our lives. And and because there's always this pull between idealism and um, pragmatism and like, you know, get get real, get realistic. What's actually real? But I think that when we when we really think deeply and are in touch with our our sense of self and our longings for purpose and or our our discernment of purpose in our lives um it's really important that we are are willing to walk towards the scary and the big um i think sometimes that requires a good uh core group of people who you trust that you can process those big and scary possibilities because with with um what does it say uh, a dream so like there's always a, a loss that comes from a, a moving towards a dream there's like um, a death of what you of how your life was to move something new and so there's kind of that struggle to acknowledge that uh, if I'm going to go there there might be a scariness of what I'm getting into but there's also a scariness of what is needing to change to make room for that Uh, which is better, 
waffle or pancake? Cynthia, no, I'm just kidding. No, no, Jackson, great. Um, I, I'm preferential to waffles, um, but that's the same way uh, brownie around the edges are better, you know, got more edges. Uh, if you woke up one day and the whole world had turned you uh, you overnight, what a what a thought! What do you think the uh, what do you think you would notice first? Uh, what would um, what would I in that everyone? What sorry, I'll figure that one out, but. Um, well, first of all, I think this is a common UU notion of like, what if we all like packed up and moved to North Dakota or some like small remote area, like wild, wild country, you know, that, do that documentary um, or like some sort of like intentional community. And the reality is, is that that is a very, um, not only impractical thing to do, but a very neglectful thing of the rest of the world um, that changes. So part of this is though, is an assumption that there are some core Unitarian Universalist beliefs that if universalized would lead to a more loving and compassionate um, world, less violent world, et cetera. And the problem of course, is that we are all human. And so I would expect it wouldn't, nothing would necessarily feel different because everyone would be doing what they were already doing, whether explicitly outward or implicitly or in denial or something, which is trying to figure out what the heck is going on here and try to figure out like how to live all these questions. So, um, so it's kind of like, it would be just as many questions as we had prior. Um, it doesn't just open the floodgates of of uh, addressing um, homeless homelessness in the, this country, or um, you know, addressing all these things like it. Uh, and so, it would require, I guess, one way to say it is, uh, it would be a lot of people who might be running around without strategy. Um, the goal would be, I hope, day two would be us really starting to get more strategic and thoughtful, which is why I like I'm like the visioning sessions and such so that we can't, can't just get these big good feelings, but we actually have strategy to integrate um, and, 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 and measure difference that we can shape in community here and beyond these walls. Um, and um, we need a bigger boat, I think, here in this congregation. What is one of the funniest things that has ever happened to you? Jeez, I'm pretty straightforward, pretty serious guy. Um, gosh, uh, you know, Hattie is uh, much better at at like short term memory and such. You know, like it's got to be something related to our kids, and you know, like I don't know. Honestly, like I don't. I I I try. Uh, there's kind of like situational humor. It's more like it's more like Jerry Seinfeld. And then there's more like, like, you know, like boom, boom, you know, and it's like, and like I sort of like try to see the the lightness in everything along with the 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 solemnness. So um, and I usually just kind of am moving on to the next thing, you know. I, I try to try to look for the the next, the next joyful moment. Um so sorry to bum that or uh, you know bust that bubble okay um what would you like to be if you hadn't become a minister um well first of all i have to say that holly has already talked about becoming a minister when she's older she says i want to be a minister like you daddy when i'm older i was like oh well what does a minister do she's like um you show up early and you set up things i set up things so i more like a, cause a sexton, I guess, but you know, I, I like the notion. I do like the idea of something more hands-on, uh, physical, um, you know, I'm in my, I'm in thoughts, emotions, community, human work so much right now. So I, it, it would be fun to, to do something that's more in the, like, um, more hands-on stuff. But I think to be honest, I would, I would do, uh, teaching, um, as the congregation looks towards 2030, who wrote this? What are you, uh, what are three areas on your mind and heart that you are um, 
that are your hopes for the congregations? Gosh. Um, okay. Um, so first of all, I think over the last 20 years, this congregation has been sort of, you know, since the mo moving out here, um, this congregation has slowly been um, understanding itself as a regional, a, um, a regional uh, um, oasis for liberal and progressive thought in South Central Indiana. Um, I think when you're a smaller congregation, you know you're a oasis for those things. Um, but also there's there's this kind of like um, the doors are open and pe people come in, they can come in as opposed to sort of really recognizing like there are people out there who are hungry for community and it is um, somewhat selfish to not be trying everything we can to acknowledge this beacon um, here in, in, Colum in Columbus area. So I think one of the things the first thing would be that we are more um, radically and unapologetically um, uh, visible as Unitarian Universalists. We acknowledge that, like, we're, when we do things, it's from some type of of moral or philosophical um, core, you know, that drove us to that. Um, which, again, maybe this isn't that influential on your lives, but more likely than not, it does shape a lot of. The kind of the ripple effect of things you do. So I think we'd be more be less uh, self conscious in talking to people about uh, Unitarian Universalism. I think we'd be more um, uh, invitational and not see that as proselytizing or concern, and and see that as like, why would I go and have this great morning experience, and I see my neighbor every day just kind of being alone after her husband died, and it's just sort of like, well, I'm just gonna not tread on her. You know, it's like we have to be more courageous in, in that aspect. Um, the second thing I believe would be for us to really um, expand um, the offerings that we can make in this building. We do have space limitations. Um, we feel that with like a, a group of 20 people during the hour after service, only being able to meet in the sanctuary. Um, of That's like the only space that can accommodate 20 people uh, during coffee hour, uh, besides coffee hour room. So there are physical limitations um, for our children's programming, for our adult classes, uh, for just kind of the, the the mid or mid or large spaces that are limited here. So I'd love for us to explore what is that, what does that mean to be able to offer more things and be welcoming to that outside community if, um, if we don't have the space to welcome them. The third area I say would be for us to really think about what it means to be in a interfaith campus, um, to not see that as just, uh, to see it beyond what it is, which is a great way to like have proximity to other people and use shared space and stuff, but to actually think about what does it mean to be, to, to grow as a Unitarian Universalist around people who are grounded in a different religious history um, or or spiritual teachings or whatever. So um, so that that proximity is really important to me from like a, how can we do this human development without being with uh, people of different traditions? Like like we have to shift to say, not like, well, how can we be together? It's like, how could we be apart? Um, in a developmental um, idea, developing of the human, the community, the society. Um, so this is an area of great interest to me. It's an area of uh, I'd love to do continued study on. Um, and so how this built environment really invites um, shared imagining of programs, um, chalice circles, other kinds of you know groups and teachings um, that aren't like, well, this is our program. You can come if you want. Or, you know, or it's an open to everyone thing, but to actually figure out how do we dream um, non-proprietary ways of, of living in pluralist society. What religious tradition next to Unitarian Universalism do you personally most identify with or take the most inspiration from? Uh, okay, I would say, uh, I would say most likely it's Judaism. Um, early on in my undergraduate years, I took a couple classes on Jewish studies, Jewish ethics, um, uh, you know, text studies and things like that. 
and there's such a, an immense amount of um you know the uh, teachings of the rabbis throughout throughout time and also just the um rich tradition of of spiritual discernment and and development um there's if you love stories there's stories all over the place uh, not only in in the torah or the tanakh but also the talmud and then just oral traditions from all these different ways so um i think there's I think it's uh, really interesting that um, Unitarian Universalism sort of springs out of Christianity, um, but um, I think there needs to be a doubling back to to recognizing some of the wisdom that has not been integrated from our Jewish siblings. Okay. Maybe it means thoughts on interfaith campus um i'm gonna just wing it um i think the interfaith campus is just we can't take for granted how rare it is to have five organizations choose to be in community again of differing levels of intimacy of between our organizations um that is a, a global phenomenon um uh, and definitely a phenomenon in the United States and in Indiana. Um, and if we start treating it like that, um, how do we see ourselves as uh, um, model experts for helping build more pluralist communities beyond beyond this area? Before COVID, there were hikes. I did go on a hike with some of you um, often, maybe like once a quarter. I would love to redo those hikes. Um, that would be a great thing to put in the January program guide. Submissions due December 20th. Um, uh, but like a quarterly hike is a great thing. Um, and it's a fun, we just like meet up somewhere or we can meet here in carpool. Uh, you know, something, it doesn't have to be, it's not like a super strenuous thing, you know, like, uh, but um, but that could be a great way, a great way to meet people. Um, the other thing that I've I've talked with some folks about, which is not what you're asking, but is, uh, about restarting small group dinners, uh, which uh, was a uh, fan favorite for many years and hasn't been uh, going on for various reasons uh, throughout the pandemic and, and a little prior. Um, but another way to just kind of meet pe meet more people in different ways um, and not just have everything loaded on Sunday morning. There were also occasional gatherings at different restaurants. <laughs> I love food um, and cereal and all those things. Uh, so um, yeah, I think that's great. I think, I think you know, we try to have some food here on Sundays. Uh, some Sundays are more than others, uh, but I think it's great to kind of think about, you know, how do we create some like meetups or like if you're in a chalice circle, uh, you're like, hey, afterwards we should all go out to lunch. Or if uh, you're volunteering, you know, like just find ways to say it's not like there's no after school activities. You know, it's like that's where all the good stuff happens, not like during you know, second hour. So, um, so I would encourage that kind of stuff. Um, and, and anytime when anyone wants to go out to, to lunch, you know, it's on me. So you just, just call me and, um, within reason first, 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 uh, 10, um, there were also occasional, oh yeah. Have they resumed? And if not, are there plans to do so? Oh, well now there are. Okay, great. How do you personally balance, um, keeping, up with current events, particularly the difficult tra tragic situations with the need uh, for self-care, particularly caring for mental health, how do you decide when to turn it off, especially knowing others can, uh, can't just tune out? Well, that's a good one. Uh, they're all good. You're all good. Um, this one is, so I, I really uh, value talking about and studying um, and experiencing my own and others suffering. Um, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is one of uh, the people who I resonate with, with most from the Buddhist uh, tradition, uh, which is a wide wide set of traditions. Um, and he wrote a book called No Mud, No, Mud, no Lotus, um, which is about like the art of suffering, or I forget the subtitle, but, and it really talks about just kind of the, the twin the twin relationships between happiness and suffering and being aware of and acknowledging that that suffering is, is, is not always present in that sense of like, we'll never address it, but like always present as in 
like that, that someone is, is having a tough time when you're not having a tough time and when you're having, you know, et cetera. And so by doing that, by being in touch with suffering, it makes the suffering around me not, I'm not numb to it, but it's not going to um, uh, burn me out in the way that sometimes it can happen when you see something and you're, you're, you crumple, you know, um, I have emotional depth, I like to think, but it, it, and part of it is to um, acknowledge within me wh where am I, where am I, um, where am I in this moment, and how do I be in touch with my own suffering as I experience someone else's? Um, uh, and I also think being uh, studying history and other things can be helpful in in understanding current events, um, and also just. Um, but I also think boundaries and self-care is really critical to, to be able to have the energy to process information as it comes in. Um, it is hard to turn it off, um, especially in a smaller community where it's like, we'll see each other kind of all over the, all over the community potentially. Um, and I'm also very involved in civic, uh, civic work, uh, in, in various nonprofits. Um, but ideally, uh, or not ideally in reality, uh, almost every night I put Holly to bed. So um, there is that that primacy of commitment. Have you always been a part of a UU congregation? Like were you raised religiously? Yes. So I was raised Unitarian Universalist. My father uh, was attending a congregation uh, when I was born. He was attending one when he was a young adult in Milwaukee. Um, so when uh, my mom came along, my brother came along, and then I came along, we um, all, be, all were all Unitarian. And so... Um, so for 34, almost 35 years, I've been Unitarian, and that has been deeply influential. And I went intentionally to a Catholic university and a Christian seminary, as opposed to a state school and a UU seminary, uh, in part because of the value of learning um, among diverse religious folks, including folks I completely disagree with. I am feeling more and more pessimistic about the state of our nation and the world at large. Is there anything you can share that would make me feel more optimistic? So, no, I, I think pessimism is, is like, is a great tool, but what I think is more is like hopelessness. Um, because when we when we're in touch with that sense of hopelessness, pessimism is more just like it's kind of like cynical. It has a little bit more of an emphasis on like skeptical, like I'm like like I don't know. I like the word hopeless more because Unitarians uh, often like are like the hope people. We're like the love people, but also like the hope people. Things will get better. Things per the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It will happen. Just let people either die out or time will unfold. We'll get there. And I think when you're in touch with your pessimism or hopelessness, um, you recognize that there's a different place to act from, uh, which is desperation. And I think desperation is a great place to live because it's not a place a lot of Unitarians ever have to be in. I mean, sometimes there are real situations um, that you uh, you might be in a desperate place. But my understanding is that when we when we act when we act from a place of hope, um, there is this sense that someone's on our side. Um, and when we act from a place of de desperation, we're all we have. Um, in whatever we're, whatever cell we're in, you know, um, and so I'm optimistic in so far as I think people are recognizing how desperate the situation is becoming, and how um, there's no one to save us except us working together. Uh, that might be pessimistic, or it might actually be um, liberating to recognize that um, we have the abilities to alleviate suffering. Uh, from those around us, not to eradicate suffering, eradicate hate, white supremacy, all these things, but we do have the ability to lighten the burden and pain on our communities if we choose to recognize our power. What is the history of the two tapestries hanging on the wall? Great. So these were gifted to us by the Jewish congregation that continues to meet in our building, um, Shari Shalom. And uh, they were put up in the 8th Street Church, which was where you all were before building this building. Oh, is that wrong? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. Some some have, some weren't. It's the Eighth and Franklin Building. Eighth, it's in between Franklin and Washington. It's a little tiny church, um, and these were up in some of the stained glass, you know, window areas. Um, I think for a lighting issue as well, but uh, or like a, but it was a really beautiful addition, and uh, it continues to honor our relationships. So you can see them. Uh, either menorah or similar concept to a menorah, Star of David, et cetera. I think there's some other references, maybe corn, maybe some other things. And that would be a great thing to think more about because it's a great thing uh, honoring our relationships. Okay, last one. If you could have any superpower, what would it be and why? Oh, <clears throat> let's see. Um... Uh, I don't, um, I would say, I think, I, I think it would be time travel. I mean, I think that that is not for butterfly effect, you know, saving things, but to a, a time travel plus one, you know, so I get a, I get a, what's that a company, uh, when you get enough points or something, you get like that plus one free uh traveler um where i can where we can have moments of deep reflection on lived experience whether that's like going back to a childhood moment to kind of um see things in a way that your heart is blocked perhaps from seeing right now or to a historical moment um and i feel like you know scrooge was like that was that's a deeply powerful transformative thought to be able to live to to relive moments of either missed opportunity, not to say, oh, man, I should have done that, but to but to find spaces of honoring and letting go so we can move forward. Because I don't think we can move forward as effectively without addressing our pasts. And we all have a past um, and we all have things that we can learn from it and um, acknowledge and, um, and as we, as we kind of move towards this, towards this better future.